Hey everyone, welcome back to the Girl of Gen Z podcast. I'm your host, Clarissa, and today I have a special guest by the name of Rob McCallum on the show. Now, Rob actually used to be my film professor back when I was in school for television broadcast and film production. But on top of that, he is also an Emmy nominated and award winning filmmaker. Now, in this episode, Rob shares his experience as a filmmaker in the industry thus far and some advice for future filmmakers out there. As always, if you guys are watching this on YouTube. If you can go ahead and hit the subscribe button, that would be very much appreciated. And the notification bell to be notified every time I have a new podcast upload to my channel. And if you are listening to this on the podcast app, if you can go ahead and give this a five-star rating, that would be very much appreciated. And in the episode notes to this episode, you will always find the timestamps. And in the episode summary, you will find the social media links. Now, without further ado, let's get on into the episode. Hi, Rob. How are you? I'm doing well. It's lovely to see you again. Yes, long time no talk. And I guess I haven't seen you in a while either. So long time no see. <laughs> yeah, it's been a bit since we last encountered one another. Yes, yes. So before we get into the questions in this episode, I just want to get you to give the listeners a little bit of a synopsis about what you do. Sure. I'm a filmmaker. That's the easiest way to start. Uh, I sometimes prefer to just say storyteller because I've worked in video games and in other written mediums as well. Uh, but for most of my career as a filmmaker, I've been working in the documentary side of things, usually in the pop culture space, dealing with a lot of uh, themes of fandom and people going after various streams. Awesome. Awesome. Well, to dive into a little bit of your past, what was your childhood like before you started all of this? It was so tumultuous that I had to make a movie about it. <laughs> Explain. Uh, well, in 2014, I made a documentary film called Missing Mom, in which my brother and I hit the road to see if we can track down our mom who's been missing for almost 25 years. And during the course of that film, we talk about our history, the family dynamics that we had, um, which reveal that I was raised by my grandparents. My brother was raised by his grandparents. Uh, after our mom uh, and essentially both my dad at one point and then his dad at one point, they just couldn't make their relationship work. So each of the grandparents kind of stepped in and, and decided to raise us. And we, were, we still remained close through the summers, spending a few weeks together and on holidays and lots of phone calls and stuff. So we grew up pretty good. And when I went to school in the Toronto area, he lived in Whitby. So we got to hang out together a lot more uh, then, which was which was really fun. That's awesome. Did you play any sports or were involved in any like extracurriculars growing up? Uh, yeah, I guess in high school I played hockey, house league hockey, nothing like officially competitive. I was captain of my bowling team for the one year I did bowling when I was six or seven. I played five pitch. I don't think I played t-ball. Um, that was pretty much it. I was in, I was a boy scout, so I know how to be prepared uh, that was fun for a while until I think it was grade nine or so when I just got sick of going to the meetings and wanted to do more of the camping. Plus, things start to change around that age. You get interested in other things like music and whatnot. And I've been playing guitar for 25 or so years. And so jamming was a big pastime through high school with my buddies. We'd mainly just go over to the same friend's house. His parents were totally cool. They'd go out for a few hours a night. We'd jam four or five hours. They'd come home. They wouldn't care. They'd tell us to play some songs. And that was pretty much growing up for, for me. I've, I'm one of the few kind of people that the friends that I made when I was, you know, five, six, seven are still the close friends in my life to this day, even though now we live all across Canada and, and at different parts, you know, or different points lived in different parts of the world. But, you know, those five or six friends are, are still the ones that, uh, that we can count on with one another. So that's, that's pretty cool and kind of rare. Yeah, for sure. I, Cause I was watching your missing mom documentary actually the other day. And I, when the, it was at the intro where you had all of the name keys and it was like longtime friend, good friend, longtime friend. I was like, oh, he has so many. Like, it's so hard, I feel like, these days to keep in touch and stay that close to so many, especially childhood friends. So I was quite shocked when you had that many. Yeah, I mean, it's not a case of picking and choosing. It's just like, well, you know, some people just click and get it. And we usually have that one or two one those one or two people in our lives when we call them up even if it's been a month or two it's like time hasn't passed at all and i'm just fortunate that you know those especially those people that you saw at the beginning of that film or close to the intro those are the same guys in my life always i literally got a text message before 
we started this chat just checking back and forth we're doing like the big covid check-in see how everybody's doing you know, my one buddy's in ottawa my other friends are in bc there are some in calgary so we're just kind of keeping in touch a little bit here and there and that's yeah pretty pretty lucky to have that kind of group of supporters that's awesome. That's awesome. So let's transition into your post-secondary then. Where did you attend? Is it university, college? Did you do both? I did both. I did uh, my undergrad in film studies at Western. I uh, graduated with honors and had my degree presented to me by Christopher Plummer, of all people, which was kind of cool because he was getting his honorary doctorate the same year that I was graduating. And then I uh, did two post-grad certificates at Sheridan and their advanced television film program. The first year it was in producing and writing, and the second year it was in directing and design. Okay, so lots of schooling there. Yeah, I, I can get acclaimed and then acclimated to a lot of schooling and institutions. And once I figure out the rules of that stuff, I can really kind of thrive in that. So that's why transitioning to the film industry and understanding how stuff like tax credits and production it gets, it's just second nature to me to be able to get into those vehicles and modes of operating and just kind of going full tilt. So you did you find school then super ben beneficial? Like you took a lot away from it when you left? Yeah, and I think uh, certainly in hindsight, I took away more than maybe I realized in the moment. Um, a lot of filmmakers would question going to uh, a theory-based curriculum like Western offered where there was almost no practical filmmaking. But I broke the rules when I was at Western a few different ways. One, they had this silly rule where you had to take stuff outside your faculty to expand your horizons. So we had to have a science credit in order to graduate. And I wanted to get it all over with. So one term I was taking like nine credits or something like that, and you're only supposed to take six. But because the faculties didn't know about the other kind of faculties, I was able to take the two other credits outside the arts faculty on the science side and get it all in and kind of just get it out of the way. Uh, and then in my fourth year, film became its own department because it had previously been underneath the English department. So when it became its own department, a bunch of new courses came in to being like intro to film theory, intro to aesthetics, intro to this, that previously weren't there before. So I took all the intro courses in my fourth year because they didn't have anti-requisites of the old course, which were now advanced this, advanced that. So technically, I probably shouldn't have been able to do that, but I did it anyway. But the teachers knew, and instead of doing like written essays on why I think this, the color red means this in this film, I basically made films that kind of explore the same thematics and showcase the same techniques. So instead of doing any essays my final year, all I did was make films. Basically, every weekend was another short film. And last year, I made 25 shorts. Holy. And how was your teacher's responses to that? Well, it was a lot more interesting for them to watch a five to 10 minute film than read a 2,500 word essay. I bet. I bet, yeah. especially having to read so many and just like, that would be such a nice break. Yeah, it was different. And as long as they saw the point I was making, it was like, okay, 80 or okay, 95, whatever you want. Yeah. It didn't matter because I was kind of graduating and it'd be stupid for them to mark somebody down who could easily and in conversation explain the theory so clearly. It was all about execution, which is kind of what production is anyway. Right, right. Wow. All right. Well, then jumping into more of the film questions, I guess. When did you know sure. that you had a passion for film and wanted to make it your full, full-time profession? I was, again, super, super lucky. I knew in 10th grade that I wanted to make movies. And again, I, I discovered this by breaking the rules. Uh, in, in a French class in high school, we were all asked to write a story in French and then present the story in front of the class. And I'm not against doing presentations or anything like that. And I don't know why it clicked in, but I thought, I'm going to make a movie instead of doing a presentation. So I made a movie, and it was essentially a parody of Evil Dead, the Sam Raimi classic. Um, it was called Le More Malzain, which is Evil Dead, translated. And it was hokey, and it was bad, and I had an actor who couldn't speak French, and it was horrible. <laughs> there. To get the music into the, to the movie, I mean, I was shooting on... Uh, like video eight it wasn't super eight or vhsd it was video eight and to get music in there i had a ghetto blaster following the camera as it did like a sweeping shot through the house and there's so many continuity errors like we had candles set up and they're like burning up and down as we're changing different shots and it was a lot of fun so that was cool i'm like oh that was fun to do but when i saw the reaction from people when they saw it that was like yeah okay i got to do more of this because not only did i enjoy doing this 
and it was a lot of work, but rewarding. A lot of people really liked it. So then it just kind of went from there. That's awesome. So did you keep doing that throughout high school then? Like in grade 11, not grade really. 12? Uh, not really, because I didn't have a lot of opportunities to do to do films or make movies for stuff. Uh, the first three films I made were all from French classes because the same teacher had carried over. Or w if it was a different teacher, they had heard about the film that I did the year before, and they were like, yeah, go ahead and do it. Mainly right. because they knew making a film was going to be more work than writing a story. So that's what I got graded on and, and allowed to do by by proxy. What was your first camera that you shot on? It was a Sony Video Hi8, I think it was. Okay. Do you still have it around to this day? I, I do, and I have the tapes, and I, uh, of course, Mini DV was the thing that we mainly shot on at, at college, and I just got a new Mini DV deck, so I can put the Mini DV tapes in and transfer them to my computer now. And I've got this sick. giant shoebox, probably full of 200 Mini DV tapes, all raw footage, I'll finish projects and stuff that I'm going to capture and digitize to kind of have them. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. Well, what were um, some of your major influences when you first started out or who? Is there specific people? Uh, <laughs> Kevin Smith was definitely up there. I had never seen a filmmaker talk about pop culture and movies. It was always about stuff that you just talk about, right? Like, and then here comes a filmmaker who wants to talk about movies within his movie. I'm like, oh, that is really cool. Uh, stuff like that, stuff like Dazed and Confused by Richard Linklater, definitely huge. Tarantino, Sam Raimi and the horror stuff, like I said. Um, and then it was probably Spielberg, uh, for sure, because, you know, well, what's the big deal about Spielberg? And then as you're starting to make films, you start to watch them and figure out, okay, oh, this is why this is cool. And this is how these two shots work together. Star Wars, not necessarily George Lucas, but Star Wars from a producing point of view and seeing just the massive entity that a film like that can be. Um, yeah, it's, those are easily the biggest influence. And then maybe to a lesser degree, like stuff like The Shining and Clockwork Orange, some of the some of the Kubrick stuff out there was just like, okay, this is film on a whole nother level. At that point, I didn't really understand it, but I knew that it was something special and something to kind of be revered and go, wow, okay, this is a whole different kind of filmmaker that I can really appreciate. Is there a movie that um, has a lot of respect and a lot of hype and you just don't agree with? Uh, there's probably a ton, <laughs> to be honest. There's probably a ton. I mean, uh, I don't know. Throw, throw an example at, <laughs> out to me. There. Anything that's usually at the box up, I'll avoid movies, unfortunately, because of the hype attached to them, because I'll find that people talk about it too much. and I just have no interest in watching them. And the world that we live in nowadays, like there's so many things to watch that it's easy to have a reason not to watch something. That's right? so true. I find like a lot of the uh, Academy Award, like best pictures, the ones that win, it's just like, OK, I see why this is like an industry favorite, but it doesn't necessarily appeal to me on, on another level or you know, a lot of like the documentary winners and, and nominees are always like, look at this critical situation in, in a foreign uh, country and look how sad it is, subvertly saying, look how lucky we are. And I feel like, okay, I, I feel like that's every year for every documentary. And that's not taking away from how good those films are or how important those stories should be. I just feel like, okay, if I want to win the best picture for a documentary, then that's what I got to be. And so like, I'm always kind of turned off by that kind of stuff. It's like, eh, I'm, I'd rather look for something else, something that's a little bit more experimental or a little bit more under the radar. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, what was the most fun and liberating project you've ever been on? Oh, they're all, they all are in different ways. <laughs> they all are in different ways. I mean, as much as going into production at this point feels the same and it's the same mechanisms gearing up development getting all the ducks in a row and that stuff all kind of happens if they're all just mind-blowing so we just announced the mr dress up documentary and going through the process of meeting those people and discovering what it was like to make that show and hearing the tales from behind the curtain it's just mind-blowing and it's just it's so fun and it, you realize it's such a big part of who you are and you walk away going oh my god this is the best thing ever and then Next week, I'm shooting like action figure adventure and we're on the road and we're in Columbus, you know, five hours away from home. We find this incredible action figure thing and like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? And the choice that we make right now is going to ripple out for the next five episodes on the series. So what is going to happen? It's like you feel like at both, you know, in tandem as like the director and the audience member, or at least I do, because I'm constantly balancing, you know, which set of eyes am I looking through and what happens if we do this or do this? You know, so 
it's always thrilling. And that's probably why I like making movies too. A little too much maybe, because I probably agree to do stuff more than I than I should, but we figure it out as we go. Right, right. So would you say your favorite role then in the film scene is to direct? I, it's not even fair at the level that I do to kind of have one role, right? Because, you know, I direct, I write, I produce, and I edit. Those are the big four. But at different points, I'm doing the roles in different capacities. So I'm almost always kind of writing in the background a little bit more at the beginning as I'm pitching people and getting people involved and on board and a little bit more writing as I'm editing because they kind of go hand in hand with documentaries. But producing and directing are always kind of like this give and take as I'm setting up the interviews and the logistics. And then once I get there, I'm directing it and, and getting it together. So everything, <laughs> man of all seasons, I don't, I, I don't know what to say. I, I love spearheading a project and, and being uh, the guy with the vision. That's the easiest way to do it. And that's kind of why I said at the beginning, you know, I'm a bit of a storyteller. And as you're telling the story, you can fill different roles. For sure. For sure. Um, so when you feel like you're experiencing like a creator's block, do you have a frequently used method of overcoming it? Like when you're writing and you feel like really yeah. stuck? Yeah, starting another project. <laughs> and then and then as you get down the road on that other project, then this other project starts. So like for Action Figure Adventure, we, we had started it uh, shooting or at least cementing, okay, this is going to happen by January in 2019. And then as we got the pieces together, it's like, okay, when are we going to shoot? And it's like, okay, I don't really want to go into this just yet because I have a whole bunch of other things. But I feel the need to be creative. So I'm going to start this Mr. Dress Up documentary because I know I can do about four to five weeks of work on that before I actually have to do anything outside of the house. And then by the time that happens, then I'll loop back to action figure adventure. And then they kind of just started going back and forth off one another. So you don't have like a specific technique of how you do this. It's just bouncing back and forth. Because I fill so many roles within the production cycle with at least with right. what I do. It never gets boring. So like for Action Figure Adventure right now, we're del we're getting ready to deliver the 10 episodes. We have a little bit of shooting left to do. That's on hold because of this pandemic. But right. I'm editing right now, but I also have to do voiceover. And I also have to work with our VFX graphic designer who's in Boston. And then I also have to uh, work with our music composer. And then I also have to write the narration that has to go in there and then go in my other room and record it and then jump back and forth. So doing all of those things any given day is a completely different level of creativity. And then between the little gaps where I do that stuff, like we had just announced the dress up documentary. So now I'm putting that on social media, interacting with different fans out there and talking to them about their experience and getting little bits of information about the film out, which again is being creative in another way that isn't like the same thing over and over and over again. I don't think I could just do one thing. I thought about, okay, if I could only do one thing, what would it be? And I would say, okay, maybe just writing because then I can write in a bunch of different ways but then I wouldn't be interacting with anybody or collaborating to the extent that I do. So I don't really ever get that creative block because I just jump to another section or so of something that needs to get done and I get to be creative that way. And then by the time that kind of runs its course, I can loop back to the other thing. And sometimes it's just, you don't know what to do. Just put something on the page or do the thing, knowing that you're going to come back and, and rework it because right now it's going to, it's going to suck. It's not going to be good. But you know, it'll be good before it goes out. Right, right. You mentioned you worked with a music composer. To what extent do you work in like what capacity? That's super interesting. Well, for documentaries and the stuff that we've been doing, uh, I've mainly worked with one guy. Uh, his name is John McCarthy. And usually I'll bring in tracks from other artists and stuff that I know, like backing tracks, uh, just to spot it in there. So well-known stuff. So for... Missing Mom, we, our reference was Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, all the kind of stuff from Social Network and Bird Box and whatnot. And I had my friend Mike, who was in Missing Mom, a good friend of mine. He wrote that whole score for Missing Mom on his iPhone, but in that style. And so when it came to Action Figure Adventure, which again is another kind of on the hunt kind of story like Missing Mom, I said, you know, I want that same kind of gritty atmospheric synth vibe because it still kind of crosses over a little bit into the video game territory. So I'm like, I'm going to put these temp tracks in there. I'm going to send the scenes to John. And I said, John, just give me some options. And he gives me, you know, 10 different tracks that are about a minute long each. And then we start building them down to emotions and creating themes from them. So this is the holy shit, I don't know what to do theme. This is a, oh, this is a whole new world I've never been before theme. Or this is the comfortable territory. Or this is the negotiating theme. Or this is a, 
yay, I did it theme so that you actually start codifying the emotional response through music that matches what's going on on, on screen. But it starts with temp tracks and figuring out what that whole plan is and then kind of building to that final spot. Is it a super lengthy process? I mean, it is because it, it starts, you know, when we first start talking about the, the project and what we're looking for. So as I go to shoot, John will be writing the stuff. And then as I'm starting to look at footage, he's sending the temp tracks. And then when I get them cut, he looks at them and sends me back stuff. So yeah, I mean, it takes, you know, place over six to eight months, but that's because we're both doing stuff along the way. It's not like I'm sending John some notes saying, okay, I need a track now. Hurry up because I'm editing. Right, you know, right. I give him notes and then I do my thing knowing that he'll come back to me when he's ready to give it to me. Well, that's good. That's good. Um, so my next question then how much do you compromise as a filmmaker because of financial restrictions? All the time. Everything <laughs> is compromised. Because what writer Rob wants to do and what director Rob wants to do is not what producer Rob can afford to do. Right. Um, and sometimes it only feels like a compromise until you get in the middle of it or until you start like, kind of playing around in post. I think compromise is a really good thing. I think if we didn't have limitations, you'd have stuff like you know the star wars sequel trilogy where sure there's a budget on those films of 300 million dollars but they can kind of do anything that they want more or less and and all those films so it doesn't really feel like they're restricted versus like say the original star wars trilogy where they had very real budgets in place they're bigger but they had to make some choices so I mean, at whatever budget level you're at, you're always going to have to make important choices. And I think I have to make a lot more important choices because of the budget level I'm at. And I know what I can get away with. And I, my experience tells me what works and what doesn't work. But I feel like every compromise that I do is either not as big as I thought it was when it first happened, or it turns into something better as a result of having to compromise because I've had to compromise it. And now I find myself in this new situation and it's how do I make this better? not versus what I want it to be. How do I just make this work? Right, right. So how do you budget everything out? Is that something you take on the task of doing or do you have somebody else that's either co-directing with you or a producer? It's, it's all me. It's I all do you. Everything, and I know I'm the exception to the rule, but I kind of do it all. I mean, I, I, I hire guys to work with me. I don't shoot a three-camera setup by myself. I usually have people with me. But usually I'm directing and camera operating, at least for action figure adventure I was for the majority of it. And I have one or two other camera people and we just have labs attached to the cameras for audio. And then I'm directing the talent as I'm camera operating. And we have a little bit of a game plan before we go in. Uh, and then we just let it unfold because the, the other thing that's really big and how I like to shoot and create is keep it raw and keep it real. I don't want, you know, anything that looks fake or staged. I don't care if it's bumpy and bruisy or awkward. I'd rather let it be awkward. If it's confusing to the audience, that's a problem. Then I'll find a way to communicate something clearly, whether it's through on-screen graphics or voiceover or something. But I only really like to do that if it shortens the time that it would normally take to explain something or the explanation just wasn't apparent on camera. So again, it's just all about information, but I like it being raw and letting people feel like they're in the moment and letting the authenticity of the of the experience speak. And so with that, we don't have a big crew. We just let things unfold. And so as it's unfolding, I'm kind of doing like four or five different roles. So when I'm getting ready for the shoot, I'm doing all the budgeting, I'm doing all the planning and all the organization. And then when I'm there, I'm doing all the creative stuff. So again, the give and take. Gotcha, gotcha. So from all the, I guess, documentaries or bigger films you've made to this date that are you know on the platforms like amazon prime video itunes etc which ones were more i guess higher budget or are they all basically the same or what's what's that they're, they're, been like they're all over the place um they're definitely all over the place um it, yeah i mean they're all they're all different missing mom was shot in fewer days than the other one i think it was shot in 18 days total Maybe 21 because there was a few days later on. Depends what you count a shoot date. Like if I have a camera and I interview my brother at his wedding as, as the outro of Missing Mom, I don't count that as a shoot date because it took 15 minutes to do. Right. You know, and it was like one person who happened to be the photographer for his wedding who happened to shoot other projects with me. And so I said, hey, Sarah, can you shoot this for me? He's like, yeah, sure. So right, right. we shot that. It wasn't a shoot date. It took two seconds to figure out and plan and it was done. Right. Um, Missing, Missing Mom was the least amount of shoot days. It was the easiest film to make because the the trajectory was just like 
easily it, it's so easy to follow in my in my head how it happened despite being about me it was very uh logically kind of laid out in my head early on um the two series that i've worked on video game box art stories behind the covers the eight part uh, episode series and then action figure adventure which we're working on now uh, the budgets are obviously a little bit higher because it's series work um so there's a little bit more that goes into it uh power of grayscale was a little bit higher too because there was four people on that i was one of the four and we were all doing a lot of stuff together so that would be like the one anomaly film where i was only kind of doing like one or two roles sort of i was like writing directing and producing but really only producing at the beginning for our crowdfunding initiative and then writing directing through shooting i wasn't involved in post hardly at all of the notes and cuts which was great in some capacities but different <laughs> Right, right. Well, as someone who has written many scripts, how do you know when your story is finished? When do you know when to put down the pen and paper and walk away? Uh, when you have to turn it in. That That's usually it, like, because you can work on it forever. You could have an idea five years down the road that makes it better. But at some point, you've got to get it done. You know, like, I could work on action figure adventure and Mr. Dress Up forever. I could shoot these things forever. And that's why I, You'll hear stories about people that never finish a script because they want to keep making it better, whether that's polishing grammar or changing scenes up or adding characters. These things can go on forever. They have to end at some point. At least they do for me. I get far too bored of any one project for it to go on forever. Even with Action Figure Adventure, there's a lot of similarities to Nintendo Quest because we're following the same guy on a similar pop culture mission, but there were so many different things about Action Figure Adventure that it made it worthwhile for me to do it. One, we had different technology. One, we had a little bit more of a budget. The goal was completely different. And we knew that we were gonna make a series to begin with. So it was like, okay, there's like five or six different reasons why this is so different for me and why it's interesting to me. But if it's not interesting enough, then I don't wanna stay with it forever. So you, you, you just have to determine when it's over. And a lot of that is external factors. So we've sold Action Figure Adventure. We're not done it yet. We have to get it done at some point, pandemic pending. And so we know we have to ship it out the door and it's going to be like, it's the best way it's going to you know, be because that's what we can do in the timeline. You talked about compromise. Sometimes compromise is what you can do with the time that you're given, you know? Right. And right. that's okay. Next time you get at it, you're like, okay, I really got to make sure my graphics are better because those got rushed. That was the thing that I chose not to prioritize so I could have better music or whatever it is, you know? Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Which script took you the longest to write? Well, in the documentary world, we don't do a lot of script writing. We just do fake treatments. I call them fake treatments because we write what we think the thrust of the thematic conflict is going to be. And then they get thrown out the second you start shooting them because you realize what you thought you knew about this world isn't really what you know about this world. It's just kind of what you feel about this world or what you've heard about it. So you become an expert going along the way. Even something like action figures. I've always loved action figures. I've always collected action figures. But when you start like focusing on it and getting information and talking to people, you realize you know nothing about action figures or what you do is like 10% of what action figures are. And then you look at something like Mr. Dress Up and it's like, I think this is the story that we're going to tell. And then it becomes something completely different. And you realize that it's going to be different for everybody. And everybody that watches it is going to be in the same situation as you. Right, right. Um, is there someone you have as like a go-to that you bounce ideas off of? Because I remember when you were my film prop, you said that when you lived in Vegas and you were bartending, you would just pitch your ideas there. Now you're not doing that, right? So who do you pitch your yeah. ideas to? Uh, well, my colleague, Jordan Morris, we, we've teamed up on a bunch of things. And whether he's directly involved in a project or not, um, he's, he's like the Obi-Wan. He's a little bit older than I am, but he's very level-headed, very critical. And he can, he can smell bullshit from a mile away. So <laughs> like, mm, I like these parts, but this doesn't sound like it's fully fleshed out. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I think you're kind of yeah, making shit up right around here. Yeah, that, yeah. that doesn't sound right. It's like, okay, okay. So then I go back and work on it. And usually I'll know which part needs work on it. And it's just kind of like a litmus test. Like, does Jordan know which parts I need to work on it? And when he confirms it, it's like, okay. But more often than not, he's like, yeah, this part needs work. But I don't think you've also thought about this part. And that's when I think, okay. So the part I did think I under, uh, understood and what was going to happen still needs some work. So Jordan is definitely a go-to for me. To a lesser extent, my partner, Justin Schoenrock, who I've been working with out of Chicago for a while, 
we did the White Sox commercial that's been nominated for a few Emmys and whatnot, and he's an exec producer on Action Figure Adventure and the Dress Up documentary. We work together in a different capacity. He's much more about execution and, and production of logistics and, and responsible for more of the look and getting the vision on, on, on film. So when I bounce ideas off him, it's like, how do you think we should shoot this scene? What kind of technology do we need to convey this point? What are our options? And then that's when he'll come in and say, go with a Ronin S because they're light, you know, they're really gimbal, uh, like savvy. They're not too heavy, but they're, you know, good enough that you can do some crazy stuff. Or maybe you want to go with a Ronin too, because you can do this. So he's just really good on, on the tech side. So between the two spheres, I've kind of got, you know, an angel to kind of turn to on one side or the other to, to fix all my problems. Well, that's good that you have that option. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So what equipment do you have? Or I guess maybe let me reword this. What equipment do you have to rent? Or do you have everything? We don't rent really anything because when we plan to do a production, we look at the gear we have. And then if we have to buy something, we buy it knowing that we're going to use it across two or three productions okay. at the very least. Uh, the only thing that we're starting to talk about doing is, is leasing post-production stuff. So Apple's got a pretty fantastic 24 month lease program where you can basically pay a monthly fee of, you know, two to 300 bucks, depending on what you're leasing. And then like a cell phone, trade it in after two years and get the, the newer stuff. So oh. instead of dropping, you know, like I've got a computer now that's a year and a half old that I dropped 12 grand on American. So it's a very fast post-production, you know, 5k iMac pro beast, 128 gigahertz of Ram and all this other fancy numbers it's great but in you know two years i'm gonna have to get another one so it, it'll be good for when we're doing these you know three or four productions in 4k but i'm gonna have to cycle it out and it'll be relegated to a background machine like i got a computer here i got a computer here and i got a computer over here and they each do different things all day long right so right i don't want this whole room to be filled with computers at one point so having something like a lease program makes a little bit more sense uh but that's as close as we get to rent otherwise we just buy because it's affordable and we can justify it across multiple projects. Right. And do you ever take like rental trucks out or do you just take your cars for the most part? Yeah, just, we just, uh, sometimes we'll rent a car for if we're going on a trip to the U S and there's a bunch of us for us to save some mileage and whatnot, but it's just, you know, our own personal vehicles and whatnot. Okay. Okay. And what is one mistake that most filmmakers make regardless of their experience? Uh, they get lured away by some sort of nine to five job at some point, and they probably regret wasting time doing it because it didn't help them out in the long run. It just felt like an easy way for stability. I right. think that's the thing that I've heard the most. So people will go into insurance or get a job at a call center or work at Starbucks because an agent told them, if you work at Starbucks, you won't care about leaving at the end of the day and you'll have all that time to write your script and you won't think about work like other people will get so obsessed with what goes on at work that they can't shake it when they walk home, which is good advice. But if you really want to do the thing you want to do, just keep doing it no matter what, or find a way to make the most of what you're putting on hold doing this nine to five job so that it pays off. Did you ever have a nine to five before you like really commit to film or did you just go right into it? I pretty much went right into it. So like after my second postgrad degree at Sheridan, I lived right downtown Toronto at Queens Keen Spadina, like a stone's throw away from the Sky Dome or whatever it's called now. And I worked <laughs> at a post production house. And so we sold editing, you know, suites that we built from scratch and I would teach people on how to use the editing software and how to put together Sony cameras. So that was a bit of nine to five, but I was also still PAing commercials and music videos and stuff on weekends. And then after that, I was just like, I don't want to work for somebody else. And so I just started freelancing and I found jobs because I knew a little bit of the French language because I'd taken French all the way through university and did bursaries in Montreal. But I got government work through a contractor who had basically a deal with the Ministry of Education. I did that for a couple of years. And then by the time that was over, I moved to the States and was doing either a lot of corporate stuff there that was easy and quick enough to pay for bills and still let me do a, a lot of writing on the side as well. How long were you in the States for? Almost 10 years. Almost oh, wow. 10 years. I thought it was less than that. It was 10 years. Yeah. So I think well, it was like nine and a half. I think it was 2008 to 2017. So, yeah. And what, what made you move there and then move back? Uh, same answer for both. Uh, a marriage. 
<laughs> one starting one, one starting and then it ending. Uh, yeah, so my I met a woman at a film festival. It was great, and then it wasn't great, and so I moved back. <laughs> That's the short answer. Gotcha. Would you ever go back to the states with your family now, if you had the opportunity to? Yeah, I mean, I would. My my kids are two and five, so hospitals and doctor checkup are very much part of their life. So it, it's a lot more expensive to do that down there. I think the the bigger goal is probably living six months on each side of the border. I'm a citizen on either side, so I can work freely on both sides. So to have a place that we could go there, say, four months a year because the kids are in school up here and then stay up here the rest, the rest of the time would be probably the real dream. Yeah, that'd be sick. <laughs> okay, into some fun questions then. Who is your favorite film director and why? Mm, if you have a couple, you can name a couple. Question. I don't really have a couple. I don't really think about stuff like that. Um, really? Yeah, I mean, I, I I get more excited about film concepts than, than I do directors. Like, I love Pixar as, as a company because they obviously put out amazing stuff all the time. Spielberg, again, Jurassic Park is probably my favorite film and always will be. Uh, it hit me as a 10-year-old boy, and usually they say the stuff that gets you between 8 and 12 years old will kind of be with you forever because you're discovering who you are and the things that you really appreciate. Um, again, Stanley Kubrick. Again, Sam Raimi. Again, Kevin Smith. Again, Richard Linklater. All all these people. But, you know, the documentary world, Errol Morris is, is really great. Um, it just Again, I, I'd have to go to more companies and the stuff that they choose to produce or take on, like HBO, right? Like, look at stuff that they do it's almost always awesome uh, even like this the documentary stuff that hbo is doing like mcmillions was a great series it had so much fun you know so yeah all of that i mean tiger king was fun i guess you know and i thought it was a, the original pitch for it was really interesting which is like we want to do blackfish but with big cats and so they set her on the mission to do like this big animal preservation thing and then discover all these personalities. And that's why those personalities feel like they're much more in the forefront. But like most people say, when you go back and rewatch it a couple of times, you really see how much it is more about animal cruelty and, and what's going on than it is about the characters. Right. So if your favorite genre, I guess, or type of film to make is documentaries, what's your favorite to watch? Uh, the same stuff. I just really love learning like true crime kind of documentary, real life. Like, Oh my God, truth is stranger than fiction. Right. Right. All right. Well, any exciting new projects people can look forward to hearing from you in the future? Uh, just the ones I've managed to subtly plug about 10 times. I actually figured <laughs> out that it sold the super channel and jinx Sports TV in Canada. It was slated for November 1st, but the pandemic is putting that on hold. And then uh, documentary, documenting Mr. Dress Up is the big project on everything Mr. Dress Up, how it was made, the people involved, and some interesting tidbits along the way, too. And we don't know where that's going to be yet, but we're mainly done it. We've got a little bit of shooting to do on that one, but we're wholeheartedly in post. Gotcha, gotcha. And the last question I usually ask people is, are you happy with the current path you're on, slash going on, the direction of life? Yeah, uh, yeah, I love it. Sure, <laughs> it's, it's great. I mean, I, I'm always caught between uh, loving what it is I'm doing in the moment and thinking about well, what's coming next. And I can firmly say, with these last two projects, I'm really relishing the opportunity to create these much more than I am worrying about the next project. For the first time, probably in my career, I'm just loving both of these projects so much that when we decided to announce the dress up project it was like oh I don't get to just keep this anymore I have to share it with everybody it was really yeah. strange I never had that before so yeah interesting and are your kids interested at all in what you do do they like ever ask questions about the stuff you have around cameras oh yeah my son particularly he's right into action figures now so over down here I have a bunch of action figures that we play with and he gets to see them from all different areas he doesn't understand what's rare or valuable or anything he just likes the playability which is what I like so we get to sit there and play. And he, it, it was him and his sister, Scarlett, my daughter, who got me to do the dress up documentary, essentially, because I was looking for good content out there. And I was shocked at how little, uh, you know, Mr. Dress Up I was able to find. And they looked at it and I said, Harrison, do you like this? He's like, yeah, I, th I think it's great. I'm like, why do you think it's great? Well, because it's a nice show. And if me and Scarlett watch it, then we'll turn out to be nice. So, oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I got to do something on this. 
My heart, my heart. I really pulled on the strings there. <laughs> well, do you want to share your social media links for people to check out? Yeah, the easiest way to find me on Twitter and on Instagram is at Rob McZob, R-O-B-M-C-Z or Z-O-B. That's probably the best way. You can also go to robmccallumfilms.com and you'll get redirected to our new site, which is with my partner, Justin Schoenrock, because we're starting a new shingle called Zero Cool Films. So you will see everything kind of there when it's up and running, which is pretty soon. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day today to jump on this call. Good luck with your films that are soon to be out. I'm excited to see them. Yeah, and um, yeah, thank fingers you. crossed this pandemic's over soon so we can really get on that. <laughs> yeah, thanks for taking the time to interview me. Of course, of course. And there you guys have it. Thank you so much for tuning in this week to listen to the episode. And as already mentioned, don't forget to go check out Rob's links and to look out for his future films coming out. I will see you guys in the next episode.